Hi, everyone. We're going to start the second session of the advanced track. Um, Tobias Dammers from Wildtyped is going to teach us about the intersection of Haskell and InfoSec, which I think is a pretty exciting topic that obviously isn't really talked enough um, in sort of the regular Haskell discourse on forums and uh, Twitter and so on. If you have any questions during this course, you can ask them in the advanced channel on our Discord instance. Uh, so Tobias, please uh, take it away. All right, um, so here we are, Haskell and InfoSec, information security. Before we start, um, let me quickly introduce the WellType for those who don't know us yet. Um, we're a Haskell consultancy company. I've been doing that since 2008. We have a team of 15 experts. We all work remotely, including management and everyone. Um, we provide various services. Uh, the main ones would be uh, training courses, both on-site and remote. Uh, we have some public courses, uh, but also we do specific courses tailored to the needs of your company or uh, whatever the needs are. We're quite flexible with those. And the other things we do is uh, actual Haskell development. Uh, we do all sorts of development uh, related tasks uh, ranging from actually developing software to um, consulting about software development all the way up to uh, even uh, certain uh, development management uh, tasks uh, supporting companies with uh, hiring Haskell developers so the full range of uh, Haskell development in the broad sense and um, one of our customers includes uh, the GHC project where we do a lot of maintenance and support work. Uh, if you're interested in any of these services, uh, the email address is right here on the screen, info at welltyped.com. Um, so yeah, that's us. A little bit of, about myself. Um, I've been programming since about 1990. started uh, with uh, Turbo Pascal and uh, stuff like that. Um, I got an education as a jazz trombonist tried to make a living as a musician for a while with uh, varying success. Um, but I've always been programming on the side and eventually uh, got made, made the jump into the world of professional programming. I picked up Haskell in about 2008 and immediately fell in love, um, but didn't really manage to uh, do so professionally. Uh, that only happened in 2017 when I joined Wildtyped as a Haskell consultant. And before that, I worked as a secure development, security aware developer at an information security firm, among other things. And that's when uh, my interest in information security really um, took off. And um, those who know me um, should be aware that. I have way too many other interests. So uh, if you're ever in need of a bottomless pit of useless information, I'm the one to ask. Right, so let's dive into it. Um, one more thing before we start. We will be diving into a few things that under normal circumstances are illegal to do. Basically, hacking information security, uh, information systems, bypassing uh, security, making things do, uh, making making computer systems do things they're not supposed to do. And in most countries, this is highly illegal without permission. So um, take everything you learn here uh, with, uh, with this in mind. Um, something as simple as disabling client-side validation in a web application can, in certain circumstances, get you, uh, get you in jail. Right. So be careful, and whenever you attack any th anything, any computer system, make sure you have written permission from whoever owns it before you start, no matter how good your intentions. Right, so with this out of the way, let's, let's dive into it. Information security, what are we talking about? There's this nice definition here from Wikipedia. Information security, sometimes shortened to InfoSec, is the practice of protecting information by mitigating information risks. Okay, cool. So what are we talking about? We're talking about information risks. We can classify them into these four 
uh, categories or these four aspects of information. So we have confidentiality, which means that information must be accessible, must not be accessible to unauthorized agents. So basically what this means is that we want to keep secret information secret. A uh, classic, classic example would be that you don't want anyone except the recipient to read your emails. Um, then we have the property integrity. So information must not be tampered with. Going back to the email example. Um, when I send you an email, I want that email to arrive in the exact, exact same, same state as I sent it. I don't want anyone in between to intercept it and change the text, for example. Um, then we have availability, another important property. Um, basically, I don't want anyone to delete files from my hard disk without my consent. I want the information that I need to be there when I need it. And then we have accountability, or sometimes also um, um, sometimes also referred to as non-repudiation. I like accountability better because it's a bit broader. Um, so it must be possible to show or even prove all these other properties about a piece of information at some point in time. So it's a bit of a, an abstract concept, but um, in the example of, of email, again, it means that I must be able to prove that I did or did not send a certain message. So I want to avoid someone else sending messages from my account and making it look like I sent them. Right. And all, for, all four of these can be and usually are at risk. Let's dive into the hacker mindset, because that's what we're going to need. How do hackers think? How do you actually how do, how do they work? How does one attack an information system? Three simple steps. First step is we look at the information system that we want to attack, and we just look for suspicious behavior. Anything that hints at a way that we can make the system do things it's not supposed to do. Just, just, just anything that looks suspicious. And then step two, we break it. We latch onto this suspicious behavior and we, we probe it with all sorts of stuff that, that we think might break it until we find something that actually does break it, that makes the information system do something it's not supposed to do. And then step three, once we have found such a bug, such a malfunction, such an unexpected, undesired behavior, we devise a way of exploiting it for our purposes. So we form a mental model of what caused the bug. And from there, we try to infer a way of exploiting it. Okay, so let's do this. We'll use an application that I crafted for this purpose specifically, called Pasta Bin. Uh, let's just start it here. It'll take a while, but there it is. So here's the pasta bin. It's a fairly simple application. There's no authentication. You don't need to log in. You can browse a bunch of pasta recipes, like these, very tasty. And you can add your own recipes. Um, Right, so that's the recipe. Great, works. So now let's apply these three steps. <laughs> Pasta is empty. Yeah, it's uh, okay. So let's let's apply these three steps here. This um, find suspicious behavior, break it, exploit it. 
So let's see if we can find if we, if we can spot anything suspicious. Let's look at the URL, for example. Um, there's something about the URL where um, we identify the recipe we want to see. Um, so in this case, this is recipe number five. Recipe number one is carbonara sauce. Cool. So we can just try to, huh, some don't exist, but this one does. Oh. Okay. But that's, is this, is this, is this suspicious? I don't know. Um, let's see. But yeah, it might because, well, there's, there's some information going into the system here from here, from the URL. So this is, this is an input. So let's just see if we can do weird things to it. That, uh, that seems uh, fairly normal. No problem so far, negative numbers. Point one, no problem still. What if we put something that isn't a number? Oops. This is suspicious, isn't it? So we broke it. Step two. It's broken. This is a bug. Right? Because this here gives us a regular 404. That's um, what we expect. But this here breaks. And yes, indeed, we will SQL inject this thing. And the server is even so kind as to tell us exactly what went wrong here. It's uh, exposing information. So we're going to pull kind of a little Bobby tables. We have this query here. And we can see that the thing we inputted here is injected into the query as is, without further validation. And as long as it's a numeric string, it'll just be in injected and, and turned into a number and the query will, will be valid. But here we're using letters and SQL interprets this as a column name because that's how uh, SQL works. But it's not a valid column name. And so SQLite, the backend here, throws an error and tells us, hey, this isn't a column. So now we'll move to step three. We need to find a way of exploiting this. And for that, we form a mental model. And the mental model in this case is fairly simple. We have this query here. And the code is going to somehow inject the input into the query. Right, the error error thing here. I can I can explain how that happens. Um, this is um, the result of just concatenating uh, two nested error messages. So this is the first one, and then this here is the inner one. And then when generating this HTML output, they just get concatenated together. So it's not really. It's, it's, it's not really like this is this is the error. It's two parts, this one and this one. Okay, so let's let's quickly jump back to the presentation. Um, we've been through all this. So here's what happened. This query has this bit injected. Um, and this is what the code might look like. It's not the actual code, but it's, it's quite close. And it's conceptually what happens here. So here, the unsanitized input gets concatenated to the query, right? And so what we need is we need to find something that takes this doc ID and injects something that we can that turns the query into something that gives us information that we're not supposed to get, right? So 
let's try something like this. Let's try this. Is that the one? No, oh, still no dice. So, yeah. Um, Good question here. Recipe number two didn't exist earlier. It's correct. Um, but as you may have noticed in the error here, there's this field public. And the query here says public equals true. Right? So it'll only return recipes that are public. And we didn't get. Uh, recipe number two and that could mean two things either it doesn't exist because it has been deleted or or something or it never existed and somebody just somehow created recipe three and then continue from there um or um it could just not be public and we can't tell the difference based on this query because either it, is, it doesn't exist or it's not public either way it's not going to be returned from this query and that's the whole thing we want to we want to get at the ones that are not public. So we, we want to try somehow to turn this into false. Um, but we will. We, we, we can't turn it directly into false, but we, we will trick the query into getting, getting giving us these things anyway. Right? So let's so the, the this didn't work. So why not? because our injection point is just this part here and not the full where clause. So we can say where public equals true and ID equals something and public equals false. But that just says and true and false. So that doesn't give us any recipes. And that's why we're getting the four of fours here. So we could say, okay, we want documents with ID one uh, or some idea that, that doesn't exist and public equals false but this still doesn't find something because the public equals true is still there so we need to w find a way around that so let's try or Ah, look at that. Here's the secret recipe. Remember, it wasn't there in the list. See? These are all the public recipes. And this is a secret one, so we're in. Here it is. And this is the query that we're actually producing in the back. Or rather, it's almost the recipe um, because there's still the public equals true part in there. But the trick is that um, in this query here, where is it? Here, we have this and bit and then an ID check and then an or. And due to the way uh, the, the, the precedence of AND and OR works in SQL, the AND binds more tightly than the OR. So this whole thing here from... So this whole thing here 
is one half and gets parenthesized, if you will, and this is the other half. So it will return all the documents that are either public and have ID 1 or those that are not public. And then all we need to do is make sure that the first document that is returned is not one of these. And we do that by using an ID that we suspect doesn't exist. Right. And that's that's one such ID. If we were to use an ID that does exist, oh, that's weird. Um, for some reason it doesn't work. But if 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 we did that, uh, it should normally uh, just get us a different. Oh yeah, right. It doesn't work because it gives gives us more than one. So we can do that with one. Same thing. But if we use one here that does exist, it just gives us the one that does exist, and this is a public one. So this is not interesting. So we need to make it not use those. Right. So that's the SQL injection attack, how it's usually done in its simplest form. Right. So this is this is the, the, the bit of code that caused the problem. Here's our mental model and how we managed to inject this, this parameter here. This bit is actually invalid, morally. This is morally invalid because this bit here is supposed to be an SQL query fragment. And this bit here is um, a document ID. And in this, in this particular uh, application here, the document ID uh, is supposed to be an integer, right? Like this, because if it's something that's not an integer, it doesn't work. So this, this is clearly not what you're supposed to use. Right. But if you use something like this, it'll run as expected, interpret it as an integer, and that'll work. Okay, so document ID is a document ID. It's not a raw string. And this here is a query. It's also not a raw string. But in the code, they are. They're just strings. We're plus plusing them, so that's kind of wrong. So the, the 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 most important fix for this is to use parameterized queries. Um, parameterized query is a query where you send um, the query string to the server separately from the parameters, and in this case, this. It's just so, so. So the query string is still just a stupid dumb string, um, and the parameter is sent separately. And just just to make this abundantly clear, this isn't even something that this isn't just a wrapper around this. They actually travel to the SQL server separately. And the, the SQL server injects the parameters into the query after par parsing it. So the query gets parsed from this into some sort of abstract syntax tree, some sort of internal representation. And then the, on the database server, the database engine will take this parameter and inject it into the syntax tree for the query. So that makes it essentially impossible to escape from the structure of the query through the parameter. That is by far the most important defense we have, right? But we can take it a step further. We just established that query strings or queries and raw values are not the same thing. Conceptually, we have queries and we have parameters. And these parameters are values from some sort of domain. And they're not the same thing, but they should be. Or they're not the same thing, but we treated them as such. We use strings to represent them both. And we need to distinguish them, ideally at compile time. And well, we're Haskellers, so it should be obvious where I'm going with this. 
Um, the feature we're going to use for this is the type system. So what we want to do is we want to distinguish queries from the values at the type level. And by doing so, um, it becomes near impossible to accidentally inject strings into queries. So this is the type of the query function as we had it in the original code. So it takes a connection and it takes a query as text and it takes a bunch of parameters as pairs of text to text and the result set is returned as a list of lists of te text. Everything is a text, everything is a string. It's uh, stringly typed. We're still doing the parameterized query thing, so that's, that's good, but it's still all just strings. Um, so let's, let's use types to do that. Now we have three different types in here. We have a query. We have a name parameter that is composed of SQL values, and we have those actual SQL values. Um, and if we make those new types or data types, then it becomes impossible to accidentally append, say, a string to a query, because they're different types. And that's pretty much exactly what packages like SQLite simple do. Right? So they're all mostly new type wrappers, except for SQL value, which is uh, some type that can represent everything an SQL value can be. And of course, we need to convert between queries and SQL values and strings at some point, but we have to make those, we can make those conversions explicit. So we basically channel all the conversions to a small handful of conversion functions. And this has two advantages. Um, the first advantage, it, advantage is that we, can, um, that we can work with a small trusted base of conversion functions that we know are okay or that we know of which you know that if, if those conversion functions are are safe then the entire code base will be safe as long as it goes through those conversion functions um, so if there are no backdoors then the conversion functions are the only spot we need to we need to verify um, and the other advantage is that uh, we, we we get into a secure by default kind of uh, setup uh, so the, the, the goal is to write our code such that when people use it, the outcome is either that it fails early and loudly before any damage is done, or that it just does the right thing. So it's the, the secure by default thing. Um, you want to do, you, you want to make it such that when people do the obvious thing, that it's either secure or it doesn't work at all. But not that there are any uh, situations where it seems to work, but actually does the wrong thing. And the stringy type code actually does that. Right. So, for example, uh, when, we, when we do this, um, it does the wrong thing. It injects this string here into the query, which we didn't want it to. Whereas this is the right thing. Uh, this, this is the right thing. Uh, and by changing it to use these types, the default becomes that um, when you code against this function and you use the wrong types, then it just doesn't compile. And if you use the right types, it'll go through the proper conversion functions and will fail if the conversion can't be made safely. Right. Um, just before we move on, yes. um, are your slides going to be available uh, afterwards? I think there will be. Um, Andres, uh, I think, is going to uh, post them on uh, Google Docs, I think. Uh, but okay. we'll, uh, and we'll be able to post a link to that in the, yes. uh, in the chat. There, there, there will be a link somewhere, either here or in announcements. OK, great. Uh, so the, yeah, we'll, we'll publish them. Right. Um, so we, we, we can take this um, SQLI protection in Haskell a step further. Um, I don't have the slides for that ready right now, but um, uh, basically um, this this approach, parameterized queries with, with types, means that we have to fix the query at compile time. And um, 
that's a problem because you can't param parameterize everything. Um, for example, if you want to build something like um, a facet search where you want to add where clauses dynamically, then you can't do that because you can't parameterize where clauses or you can't parameterize the, the absence or presence of, of individual where clauses. Well, it turns out you, you actually can, but it's a bit awkward. Um, so in some situations, you need to build your queries dynamically. And that means you have to give up part of the safety of fixing your queries at compile time. And um, the, basically the solution to that is to have a limited EDSL for a query construction. And then you get back to the uh, trusted base uh, idea where your trusted base consists of the EDSL that um, that constructs the queries. And as long as the EDSL can only produce valid queries uh, and the EDSL itself has been audited, vetted, verified, uh, you can be sure that any query you construct with it uh, falls within these constraints. Uh, and for example, uh, libraries like Beam or Escaletto uh, are useful EDSLs for that. You can, uh, you can use those to construct queries that are at least well formed. Um, but in practice, it's often the case that you that these are still too expressive. So as an alternative, you might consider putting yet another layer in between where you express your queries in terms of the problem domain or the business domain, and then uh, derive uh, Beam or Escalator queries from that. Okay. So um, that was the SQL injection part. Any questions on this one so far? Feel free to write them in the chat. I don't think we've had any specific ones, but yeah. I haven't seen any, but uh, if, if, if anything is unclear about this, uh, now would be the time. Yeah, do ask, do ask, do write down the questions in the, in the chat if you have them. Right, and um, otherwise I can probably get back to this later. Right. Okay, so next topic, cross-site scripting. What's cross-site scripting? Let's see. Here's an application, another one of the nice targets I made. Okay, let's stop this one and start Messenger. Here we go. So it requires a login. No, never save these. And we want to get in. And we actually have two user accounts that we can use. So let's log in. And uh, Alice password is Wonderland. Not a very good password, but who can and this is the, so here we have two mailboxes and we can write a new message. For example, let's send something to Humpty Dumpty. Yay, this is the sent message. Great. Okay. And well, it comes up here in our outbox. Everything's great. Cool. So that's the application. And we have this account, Alice. We have a password for that. Cool. Now let's see. Let's apply the hacker mindset here. Any suspicious behavior? Just the login screen already. There's something suspicious about it. Let's let, take, a, take a second and, and, and look around, see if you can spot anything suspicious here. Yep, a query string. This part here. Here's a string. Here's the same string. 
client-side validation. No, it's not client-side validation. No, there's no client-side validation here, but it's a good, 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 uh, good guess. So client-side validation would mean that the uh, password check is done in client-side code. So we enter username and a password, and then the password gets checked on the client side. And if that were the case, then um, oh, this isn't helpful. Uh, then we would see somewhere in um, in the client side code. Um, but there is no there, there. There actually is no script here. Let's see, there's only CSS and HTML. So uh, if that were the case, then we would see here on the client side. Uh, we would see some some code containing passwords or, or, or hashes or something like that. But indeed, what it does here is it takes this string and it injects it into the HTML. So we can actually change that string. Right? We can we can do all sorts of things here. And Oh, wow, you can add HTML in there. Uh, yeah, let's let's put let's put some JavaScript in here. Sure, why not? Oh, dear. We can run JavaScript inside this page. Okay, but what do we do with this? So far, the only thing we can do is we can open the, 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 the browser window and we can run some JavaScript in our own browser through the thing, but that's not so spectacular because we could just we could just write some HTML and, and, and put the JavaScript in there and then we open that in our browser. So why, we do, why, why do we want to do it like this? Fetch the secret pasta recipe. Yeah, no, this is a different one. Nobody's exchanging any pasta recipes in this one. So what's what? But what's what's useful about running JavaScript inside some HTML page? Well, the thing is, um, there are interesting things in the context of a web page. Can see them here in the uh, in the inspector. There are things in here. For example, cookies. There's an index to DB. There's local storage. All sorts of stuff that gets stored per page. So there's this page context, and that is different for each each page. For example, if we start another application here, like this one. And we go here, then there's going to be a different cookie. See, here's here's here we have. Um, uh, let's see. All right. Uh, so here we have just this uh, cookie, and here let's log in. So. Here, here, we have this extra cookie. So this is this a different context, right? Different context, different secret data. So what we want, of course, is we want to access some of this. And some, some of this context is actually available from within JavaScript. And that's what we're looking for. Um, Let's go back to the starting page, or no, let's look out. Um, so we want to use this um, this bit here, where we can inject the script to pull out some of that secret stuff. And it just so turns out that JavaScript has an API for accessing cookies. 
access cookies. We can also access index DBs, local storage, all that. Those are all JavaScript APIs. But in this case, the secret we're after is this SSID here, which supposedly is a session ID. Uh, we want to extract that and somehow access it from JavaScript. And there's this API called documented cookie that allows us to do the, exactly this, that. So we can do, say, something like this. Let's see what that does. Yeah. Right. So we managed to read the session ID from within JavaScript and paste it back into the page, into the DOM. But that still doesn't get us all the way there. Because right now, all we can do is we can open this page and we can tell ourselves a secret that we already knew because, well, we can just look at it here. So we need an additional bit. We need something. We need something to sort of, well, we need two additional bits. First bit is we don't want to steal our own cookies, but someone else's. And the second problem we're facing is um, once we've stolen that cookie, we want to get it into a context where we can read it. So we can't access someone else's cookies from here. So we need to somehow trick someone else into running this in their own browser. But when we do, then we need to get the cookie from their browser into ours or into some other place we can access them. Okay. So let's let's think about the first bit. First bit. We need to get this thing to the target, to some other user. And we need to trick them into running this. Well, that's not too difficult. We can just take this URL and we can paste it somewhere, say, I don't know, uh, Reddit or, uh, or an email or whatever, anything that they might go, yeah, we could use a URL shortener and send them a shortened link that would work. Uh, anything that gets them to click this link. And um, once they do, they'll run this. Okay, so let's let's just assume we have a way to do that. And then the next problem is, of course, that just pasting the session ID back into the HTML doesn't really help us much. Um, so we need to do something else with it. We need to get it somewhere where we can read it. Fortunately, there are a few possibilities for that. Um, one thing we can do, we can set up a server somewhere that serves images. And those can be completely tiny, single pixel, transparent images, doesn't really matter. Um, but the key is that the URL would be something like this and then we can use the query string to append arbitrary other stuff. And then on the server that handles this, uh, we would read the query string and we would extract this part. And this part would then contain the secret. And then we would just serve a single pixel transparent image as if nothing had happened and just store this secret somewhere and then pull it out later. And then we would just make the script such that it accesses this URL. For example, we could say, um, I don't know, we could um, create something like this. And then we set the source attribute and, and we inject it into the document and we'll show this image. And as soon as you open this link, um, the injected image will be loaded from our server. Um, let me just, uh, uh, let's see, I'll um, do it with this. Uh, let's go away. So I could um, do something like. Uh,
and then append cookie and then something like this and that would load the image at the end of the body and um, try to open this URL and it would bleed the secret from the cookie into my server. So that's one approach. We have a couple other um, suggestions on the channel. Um, yes. You may want to comment on. So, so okay. one is um, about using forms um, that you could, uh, could you create a second event handler to submit a form to send the password to some other server? Is one, one suggestion. Um, and then the other... Let's see. Um... Form submit. Um, in principle, yes. Mm, yes, we we yes we could we could we could in principle do that. So we could um, use JavaScript to manipulate this form here um, and change. Let's see. Um, so we can go to this form here and change the action so that it points to our own server and then post the username and password there. Yes, that would, that would already give us the password if that actually works. Uh, different kind of attack, but uh, and then the other, potentially uh, possible. Question, yes. The other question here is the, uh, the crypto mining, just uh, once you've got JavaScript at all. Yes. Yeah, then you can start mine start. crypto. Yeah. You can do. You can run whatever JavaScript you want on the client. It's uh, up to you. Yes, you could use that to mine cryptocurrency or all sorts of other nasty stuff. Right. So yes, definitely possible. Um, and since we're looking at the chat anyway, HTTP only cookies. Yes, I will get to that in the analysis. Um, and uh, course, I will also get into this. And uh, Discord, yes, we can also just, we could also uh, somehow trick this JavaScript to somehow uh, post it to Discord. But um, uh, that might or might not work. Probably not, because um, just sending stuff to Discord, which has its own page context, is probably going to be prohibited by the browser. Um, and then another su suggestion here, uh, sending an alert with a polite request to email the data for user experience feedback. Um, yes, that's basically social engineering and it works surprisingly well. Mm. But that's also not the attack we're going to run here. Uh, we could, of course, use social engineering to trick people into clicking such a link. Uh, but that's, let's just suppose We've, we've, we found a way to, to, to get them to click their, that. Um, and then we, we, we could use um, this here to send it to our own server. But we can also do a, a different thing. Um, namely, we can uh, just use the message system itself to send us the session ID. Right. So we can write some script here that emulates what the... Uh, so if we go here login, we can just emulate what this form does, this form here. It's, it's actually quite straightforward. So we can uh, we just take, uh, we can just look at the, the fields that we need. So there's this text area named body, and there's uh, the title does nothing. And there's uh, in the table here, we have the recipient, which is select name recipient and let's say admin is our target so we use recipient ID one and then we have the subject line somewhere here name title body so those are the three fields that we need to send submit button doesn't carry any data so we just need these three fields in uh, in our form and we can use JavaScript to construct a form and send it so basically we can construct uh, a malicious link here that tricks the recipient into submitting a form. Uh, this form submitting we can then do with, for example, uh, 
AJAX, XML HTTP request, which is basically just an API for issuing HTTP requests from within JavaScript. So let's see if I can pull this off. Um, ah, nice. Somebody posted the link. Uh, let's see what that does. Ah, of course I can't just paste it there. Uh, let's see. Right, we, can, we can actually just try it. Allow this request. You can't see it here, but that doesn't work. But it will. Okay, so I just have to copy it over. Um, evil.com, yeah. So yeah, something that like this could work. Um, where was I? Let's look, I have something prepared here now, after all. Quickly scroll forward. I've done all this. So here's a bit of code that emulates the form. Um, so we construct an XML HTTP request, send it to our own message system, and make it uh, post this form here with the cookie in it and send it. So here's a suitable URL. So let's say we're logged in. And we just use this URL here with this mangle script in it. It does indeed produce this slightly weird uh, login screen. But if we look at our messages, we see that we have actually sent such a message to ourselves. And that message contains our session ID. And this is our own session ID, so it's not very useful right now, but that's because we clicked it ourselves. Um, but if we manage to get this admin user to open the same link this year, then we're in. So all we need to do is we send a message. With this in it. And then we could, um, I don't know, um, we could say uh, something like this. Might actually work, I don't know. Um, or uh, let's say, uh, Send that. And in this case, it doesn't really work because the admin user doesn't actually read and click. But if they were, we get a message similar to this one that contains the session ID. And then we could go and uh, just edit this here to use the real value for the admin user and it'd be in. Right. So if we were looked, locked in at the admin, as the admin user, which so does the session ID. And this is how, how we, we've already discussed this, we need to mount it somehow. Um, so we could send it an email 
can use a URL shortener, or we can uh, put it in a form somewhere, or whatever. But either way, it will work. All right, so th there have been a few questions about uh, course headers and, and, and stuff like that and uh, and all that. So uh, this is a good moment anyway to, to dive into the script security on the web detour here. Um, so we've been talking about page contexts. So cookies, local storage, IndexedDB. And these contexts need to be isolated between contexts, between pages. And page here uh, is mainly uh, defined by the domain that we are. Right. So foo.com should um, should not be able to contact to access the context of bar.com, different domain. But a problem, of course, is that JavaScript can't access anything within the page context. So um, basically, um, we need to make sure that a script can only access things that it's supposed to access. And that's where the same origin policy comes in. So the same origin policy basically says that uh, whenever you run a script, then it can only access things from the context of a page that comes from the same context as the script itself. So basically the same domain or a uh, subdomain, right? So same origin means the same server, is the assumption here. And the context, that's the second assumption, is something that is confidential between the client and the server. So any context that I use in a page as a user, as a, as a client, uh, that's between me and the server I'm talking to, the server that gave me the page. And any script that also comes from the same server is thus basically part of our little world here where we can exchange this information. So the scripts enjoy the same privileges as the server. And scripts that come from a different server aren't allowed to access the context because they're not in the same uh, domain. Right. The actual mechanism to determine the origin of a script is a bit more involved. Um, so essentially a script comes from a page if it was loaded in a script tag um, from the same origin. Um, all right, question here. What about a uh, common domain with URLs like uh, uh, like the one here, uh, users.example.com slash somebody? Do they all share the same page context? Yes, they do. They do. It's essentially uh, just the domain, not, not the path. So everything under the same path, under the same domain with different path is considered the same context. It has to be, because if you look at this exa example here, we have this, this URL here with this path, and then uh, here we have a message with a dynamic path, uh, we have the new message form, and it's, it's, it's all, it all needs to be in the same context because it all, it all shares the same login. And it's, it's basically impossible to tell from the path here whether it should be, uh, uh, whether it should be the same domain or not. So it has to be the same domain, it has to be the same context. But this part here, the domain, stays the same. And that's where we uh, distinguish contexts. So that is why it's better to have, um, when you have separate users under this, on the same server, um, it's better to distinguish them by domain or by subdomain than to distinguish them by path. Um, right, so so that's um, that's that's how how that uh, works. Right, same origin policy, um, and of course, um, sometimes you actually do want to allow scripts from another domain to run. And that's um, that's basically where uh, where the where the course headers come in. They, they, they tell you that 
um, requests to a different domain are okay in that script from certain domains uh, or that that, um, yeah, that that scripts from a certain domain may run in the context that's that's among other things how things like um, third-party cookies are made possible you can also use cookie parameters to widen the scope of a cookie so the default for a cookie is that it it only gets sent to uh, the same domain uh, it's not, not not directly relevant to 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 uh, same origin policy but it's similar policy. so normally a cookie has a dom an unspecified domain and unspecified domain means it defaults to the exact same um, to the exact same uh, domain name uh, let's see um, so you have a, a cookie that is, is, is scoped to um, so, so, so a cookie is set on let's say uh, foo.example.org and if you don't set the cookie domain then it'll only be sent to this exact dom domain so it won't be sent to example.org parent domain it won't be sent to uh, bar.foo.example.org and it won't be sent to bar.example.org either but it will be sent to foo.example.org but if you do send it explicitly to for example example.org will be sent to all of these because this essentially means dot example dot org and that means any subdomain below example dot org and example dot org itself we can also scope it on foo dot example dot org it just has the same meaning as this so it'll still be sent to food.example.org, but not to the parent domain and not to sister domain, but still to all subdomains, no matter how many I add here. Right? This one is implicit. And for session cookies, the recommendation is to just use the implicit one because we really only want to the cookie to be valid for this exact domain not for any subdomain and not for the parent domain not for any sister domains and the only way to achieve that is to not set a cookie domain at all if you set one it'll always cover all the subdomains under it but this can be useful for for for, for things like a single sign-on or for uh, sharing settings client-side settings between subdomains so there is a use case for it but for for session cookies that you use to log into a specific site just uh, use the default okay right so that's that's that one um this is so let's see the, the mechanism that we exploited here then is that as an attacker mm, we can trick the victim into running a script that we provided and run it within a legit page context. And the page context has things like session cookies, the authentication tokens, and so on. And we can use that to, to steal them, basically. Right, uh, another question on the chat. Um, Forbidding inline scripts should help a lot. Um, no, actually, it won't. Because th these are not inline scripts in, in, in a strict sense. Um, or they, what happens here is that um, we put the script in the URL, and then it gets sent to the server, and then the server creates HTML based on this, this input. And the HTML contains a script tag. The script tag is, as far as the client is concerned, completely independent from the, from the stuff we sent in the, um, in the, in the, in the URL. Um, 
right? Content security policy that could that could actually work, yeah. But anyway, um, and there's a question about is the scope of the cookie defined in the back end or the front end? Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll get into this in a, in a second. So forbidding inline scripts uh, should help a lot. Um, in theory, yes, um, but there is basically very little holding us back from uh, or preventing us from uh, just uh, um, just putting the scripts in, in, in a file somewhere. And, and I believe um, I'll, I'll, I'll have to look this up actually. Whether what the content security policy can 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 uh, can actually prevent this, but I'll get into a, a much better defense in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a minute. And then for the question, is the scope of the cookie defined on the back end or front end? Um, server defines the scope of the cookie when setting the cookie via the cookie the, the set cookie header. Uh, so that looks something like uh, actually. Uh, And then, uh, and then the definition of the cookie and that definition contains the domain and the client basically can't uh, change the domain does that answer the question i think so okay um right yes good link there the documentation for a set cookie. All right, so let's move on. Um, we have two major types of cross-site scripting, reflected and stored. So what we've done so far is reflected CSS, XSS, um, where we have malicious inputs that are part of the request, in this case, the, 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 the uh, query string. And then we trick the victim into sending such a malicious request to them from their own browser and then they get a page that uh, contains the malicious inputs as part of the html so they are reflected by the server right so we have this, this this malicious script we send it as part of the request the server takes it converts it injects it into 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 the uh, response and then the response get back sent back to the client and on the client the script is read back out and executed as if it came from the legit server right uh, so we we managed to trick the server into into sending javascript that we provided as, as the attacker and the example in this case with where we exploded is is the error message that gets injected into the into the html document uh, right here Here's the error message. Right, so so it, it, it comes from here. This is the thing we sent. We send the request. The server pulls it out and injects it into the HTML. If you, if you look at this here, it's actually part of the HTML that gets sent. It's right here. Here. It's, 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 it's part of the raw HTML. So as far as the client is concerned, there's no way of telling apart whether this has been sent through the request or not. The client has no way of, of, of telling whether this comes from a database or is hard-coded into the server-side code or comes from a request or whatever. It's, it's just, this this is indistinguishable from say this or, or, or this or any, any other bit of this HTML here. And that means the server, the client will assume that it comes from the server and is something the server actually wants to have in the HTML. Right. We can also employ stored cross-site scripting, where the malicious inputs are sent separately, and then they're stored on the server somewhere in the database. And the victim then is tricked into just requesting pages that include this stored, these stored values. So for example, we could um, we could um, send a message that contains the, the script, and then when, this, when, when, when the message is rendered, uh, the script would run. So if we can find a way to do that, then that would also work. Uh, same idea, but we separate the, um, the injection from, the, from actually running the, the script. 
Um, I will do that in a minute. Um, bum, 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 bum. Question from the chat. Um, so the server is injecting the query par parameters into the HTML being sent to the client. Yes, that is exactly what's happening here. Uh, the server generates HTML, probably based on some template, and it serves dynamic HTML that includes some values sent by the client. That's what happens in the reflected case. In the stored case, the same happens, except that the values that are being that, that it injects aren't sent by the client in the same request, but uh, have been stored previously in some way, typically a database. Um, uh, we will do that in a minute. Actually, we're going to do that right now. Messenger application take more user supplied inputs. this one. Oh, we're already logged in. That's what we're in Chrome. Okay. So here are some inputs that are user supplied. Um, let's, 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 let's see what we can do with these. So we just do here. Wild. Send this to ourselves, and it turns out that this actually does the right thing, but this here doesn't. We can have HTML in a message. It's cool. So let's try a script. Yep. So just by loading this. URL here now. We trigger the JavaScript. And notice that right now the, the script itself is no longer part of the request. It's just part of the stored message. So the, the malicious script that's in here in the body. Uh, let's see if we can show it. Here. This is the malicious script right here. It's it's actually stored in the database on the server. So that's why it's called stored cross-site scripting. Um, and it's it's often much easier to trick the victim into opening this, this, this kind of stored link because there's nothing, nothing suspicious going on here in the URL. And in fact, browsers like uh, like, like like Firefox and Chrome uh, may actually attempt to detect cross-site scripting attacks from the via the URL and block them. Or at least some plugins do, like for example the NoScript plugin. That's a cross-site scripting detection. Well, if, if, if you if you use that plugin and you add a script tag here, it'll detect the attempt and, and warn you about it. But this kind of URL is perfectly benign, so it won't trigger any of these warnings. And uh, the malicious script here is just part of the legit message body. And again, just like with the reflected XSS. The client can't tell whether this script is legit or not. It's part of the of the of the message, and it's indistinguishable from a script that might appear here, for example, or that that that, that server might inject for legit reasons. Completely indistinguishable, because it's actually provided by the server, and the client doesn't know that the server has been tricked into sending it. Right. So we can use this same approach that we used previously. Uh, let's go back to the malicious script that we wanted to use. Uh, where is it? Let's see. Somewhere. Use the script. Let's just use that same script. And we'll put it in here. a lot more convenient because we get this nice editor here, right? So same thing again, let's use a 
different titles so we can tell them apart. Uh, let's send it to ourselves to test it. Okay, we don't see anything, but if we now go to our uh, inbox, uh, we see that it has actually sent the, the thing we're after, right? Okay, so let's do the same thing again, but now let's send it to admin. Whenever you open this this message, it should send the cookie, and now it sends our own cookie. But we can go here, and uh, well, if admin were to read those messages, which for some reason they're not, they're actually supposed to. But if they were, then we would be able to see it here, and we would get another of these hello again messages, but from admin and we could go and extract the cookie and use it to log in as the admin right and i must apologize because i was actually planning on this to work so i actually have a fake admin user running in the background and it actually opens should open messages but for, for some reason it doesn't seem to work so sorry about that so under normal circumstances, we would see that message here, and I could show you how extracting the session ID here, and then uh, going here, and just overwriting it here, would actually get us to be the admin user. Okay. So that's how we run the stored XSS. There's a, there's a question on the channel or a yes. note on the channel about uh, nonces. Nonces, yes. Um, not quite, no. Um, or rather, um, depends how you use them. So the, the, the classic use for uh, for for, for those re nonces. Repeat the question for the people. Okay, so uh, yes, uh, nonces should be pre able to prevent most XSS issues unless your framework injects them too automatically. So even the injected script gets them. Uh, is, is is a remark here. Um, so 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 basically, um, right? CSP nonces. Yes, that could that could actually work. Yes. Um, However, it is still a secondary defense. This, this is important, right? So, so, so in, in the, the, the first defense is just to not allow the script to run in this page in the first place, to not have it in the page in the first place. So let's round it off. Um, there are a few other paths through which, uh, through which we can uh, inject uh, scripts. So it could also be client side HTML rendering, um, because basically it doesn't really matter all that much how the script tag gets into our DOM. Um, the moment in, it's in there, it'll be run, and whether it's client side code that injected it or uh, server side code doesn't really matter all that much. So if you have client side code that reads data from uh, from the server as JSON or whatever, and then extract ex extracts data from there and injects it as raw HTML, then you're still vulnerable. Um, even if that data has been sent as JSON or whatever, uh, JSON P is even worse in that it uh, by design. Um, it, it, it by design injects JavaScript into the page context and uh, dynamic script rendering, another one. So uh, let's look into those. Client side rendering looks like this. Um, it's not usually uh, done this way, but through some, some uh, abstraction layers and some framework. But um, the core thing is basically this line here. 
So we construct HTML from some string we got from uh, elsewhere. It can even be within the same document. So for example, um, we could uh, to get this current user from some HTML element elsewhere and then accidentally treat this string here, the name, treat this as HTML and then the username that contains the script will be ejected and run. JSON attack vector, uh, a classic one, um, classical, classic mistake that's uh, fortunately not this uh, common anymore, is to use the eval function to parse JSON. So don't do that. Uh, because basically what we can do is we can pass arbitrary JSON here and, and the eval will just run it. And in this case, it does the right thing, but if we do uh, bad things in here, it'll just run them just the same. So use JSON to parse instead of eval. JSON P, um, it's basically unnecessary these days. Um, it used to be that uh, used to get around the single origin policy. Um, Basically, what you do is uh, you tell the server uh, some things about the JavaScript you wanted to generate, and then it sends a response that's, that's plain text, contains the JavaScript, and then you inject that into your page. Um, and that bypasses the single origin policy because it's not returned as JSON or as, uh, as, as JavaScript, but as plain text. And then your client side code basically injects itself. Um, so it's, it's kind of uh, cross site scripting built into your code just to make this work. So basically, don't do that. Uh, instead, use course headers to um, whitelist those scripts. Dynamic script rendering, this is still a common thing. Um, so the, the problem we're looking at here is that you have some JavaScript in your client-side code. Uh, the JavaScript needs to do things dynamically. We need to somehow configure or parameterize it. And something that, that happens a lot is that people uh, do this here. So uh, we add a script tag, and in that script tag, we set a global variable, and uh, with with uh, with a, a with a, some some dynamic value provided by the server, and then we reference this variable elsewhere. Let's use a name variable, for example. We re reference that elsewhere in our JavaScript, and it works. But of course, if this username here contains something that breaks out of this quotation and does other things, then we're still owned, if you like. Uh, so just like HTML, we need to properly encode the JavaScript. But that's much harder than just HTML encoding, because we need to know a lot more about the context. And the, 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 the rules for determining that context correctly are pretty involved. Uh, so, my recommendation would be to just not do it and you look for other alternatives. Three of them listed here. Uh, the first one is to use AJAX and dynamically load the data that you need instead of uh, embedding it in the page. Um, and because your AJAX request is uh, typed as JSON, uh, and provided you don't use eval to read it back out, which ho hopefully your uh, framework of choice will not do, um, then uh, all you can get back out is, is JSON data, which uh, isn't dynamic JavaScript, so you avoid the problem. Um, you can also attach the dynamic data to HTML attributes, uh, ideally data attributes, uh, where because, because they give you free choice of, of, of names. And then you use JavaScript on methods to pull them out. And you can use the same trick with the hidden elements. Again, use DOM access methods to find the element and, and, and get the get its contents out. That works also. Right. So let's look at some defenses. The main one is to make sure that your HTML HTML output is actually encoded as HTML. Right. So if we have to inject some something dynamically into the HTML output that we need to encode it. So this is this is this this would be the most naive approach. We have an HTML encode function that takes this string here and converts it into HTML source code with proper encoding applied. So once you do that, nothing bad can happen anymore. 
right? But of course, it's not very robust. There's a problem here. It requires manual diligence, right? We need to make sure that every single parameter that we inject into our source code is actually encoded. So that we need to go through all the code that generates HTML and make sure that every single value that we want to inject has this HTML code function next to it. It's very easy to miss a spot. It's easy to get it wrong. We might even uh, be tempted to do the encoding earlier and then we end up doing it twice or uh, it becomes unclear whether something has been encoded or not. Difficult to, uh, to check. It gets messy soon. And it's very easy to uh, make a single mistake somewhere and then you're dead. And we can do better. We have Haskell. We have types. We can come up with a more structural solution using types. Here's how that works. So the first step we need, to, the first thing we, we want to do is rather than doing it ad hoc every time um, we um, inject something, uh, we use a structural solution, a template system. So something like this. We have this function expand HTML template. And rather than manually using the HTML encode uh, function on every parameter that gets injected, we leave that to this function here, to the, to the, to the template engine. Uh, this, this template engine here will not only inject these parameters, but also automatically, uh, automatically uh, HTML encode them. So here we just pass in a raw string. And here we reference that parameter, but the template function takes care of HTML encoding that. So this is a huge step forward already, right? Because now all we need to verify is this, this function here. As long as it's as expand HTML templates, automatically HTML code encodes all inputs. We don't have to worry it when using this function. That's uh, perfectly fine. Right, and here are some template engines that actually do that. Um, so Mustache is one of them. By default, HTML encodes all inputs. Um, the Jinja template engine also does that by default. Uh, here's my own implementation. Shameless plug. Um, but either way, um, a template engine that um, automatically HTML encodes all inputs by default is, uh, is, is a great first line defense, right? So now we don't need to manually audit all our templates. We just need to manually audit the template engine. And after that, the default is for all inputs to be encoded. And it's uh, difficult to miss a spot, or rather we can't really miss a spot. We can only uh, get it wrong altogether or not. And we don't have to, uh, scatter these HTML and code invocations all over our template code. Right. So this, this template code here, it's very clean. We don't have to worry about anything. It's, it's just, the, the default is secure. So this is the default way of injecting a parameter and it does the right thing at HTML encodes. And even if the template engine allows us to actually inject raw HTML, um, it'll be through some sort of, uh, uh, some sort of uh, opt out so we need to jump through extra hoops to do that. For example, um, in Jinja, uh, this would, would do the HTML encoding. And if you want to not HTML encode, you would go like this. So you have to add this extra thing here. Um, and uh, that, that, that would bypass the normal secure default. Right. We have, a, we have a question on the channel about yes. uh, whether these template engines are context aware. Context aware. Um, no. These engines are not context aware. I'll, uh, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, basically, what they do is default is to always apply HTML encoding to all parameters, regardless of where it happens. So that means that um, if you actually put a parameter inside, say, a script tag, it will actually do the wrong thing. 
right? So uh, let's say you do this. That you pass uh, this, then it would still HTML encode that and it would render something like this. Right? So that's. Um, it's basically wrong and it would, would break because this is not valid JavaScript syntax. Okay. Right. Was, or it, it, it kind of is, but it, it's, it's kind of nonsensical. Uh, it would cause some kind of JavaScript error because it's basically uh, this is what it would uh, parse as. So, so it would say, hey, but uh, this end operator without a left hand side is invalid. And, LT is not in scope and GT is not in scope and you, know, you can't just start a statement with a, with a division operator and stuff like that. So it, it, it would break. Um, but the important part is it would still be secure in the sense that it wouldn't manage to break out of the script tag here. So like... Uh, uh, okay, all right. So we can't just say uh, like this. If we did this, it would still HTML encode and it wouldn't manage to actually uh, do stuff. But um, we could probably uh, inject JavaScript here by, uh, or uh, probably we could certainly inject JavaScript here by just doing the malicious stuff right here. And then we just say uh, or ID equals malicious stuff. Right. Okay. So basically, um, you still need to be careful where you inject variables. And most of all, this means that you shouldn't be injecting variables into scripts. But we already established that here, right? So we shouldn't be injecting anything here anyway. Any Anything between script tags should actually be completely static, right? Um, where was I? Here. Uh, and there was another question on the chat. Um, Yes, about about, uh, uh, about template uh, injection. Yes, that is in, indeed a um, uh, uh, something to be aware of. So, um, for example, if you have a template that uh, has an inclusion mechanism, uh, so it goes like something like this, and then it says, um, uh, I don't know, uh, in the body, it says. Um, include. Um, Profile, and then we pass the parameter user if that is supported. Uh, um, or if, well, I, I, I actually I don't know how I would do it with uh, Jinja, but yes, uh, in some template engines, it is possible to break out of the actual template context and uh, or dynamically load the template. Uh, oh yeah, something like this. And the user template is provided by the server, but it's not properly sanitized, and then uh, it ends up including things that aren't actually templates, but for example, some uh, some secret files on the server that you're not supposed to see, and it'll just include them and interpret them as templates. Uh, or you can uh, you can use it to mount uh, a recursive include unbounded recursion which would eat up all the server's RAM and then all the server swap and then uh, cause it to go down. Uh, so basically a denial, denial of service attack, uh, all sorts of possibilities there, yes. Um, 
And are any of the libraries that uh, you're mentioning, do they, do they support that kind of feature or are they safe from, from that kind of thing? Um, well, it's a tricky question. So um, I, can, I can say for my own library, uh, Ginger, that uh, in principle includes are resolved statically. So you can't do any dynamic includes. So that makes it not vulnerable against this particular attack. You can't, you can't dynamically include things. Um, but of course you can um, do other things. For example, um, Ginger itself is, is fairly extensible. Uh, so one, one thing it can do is you can um, you can inject uh, uh, functionality from outside into the context. You can pass functions um, into into the execution context. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, I don't have the exact syntax at hand, but you can you can have a context that, um, uh, for example, um, I don't know uh, a function foo. And then that function does things. Plain Haskell function here with some wrapping, so you can you can actually hook Haskell functions into the Ginger execution context, and then in your template uh, you could uh, run this uh, foo function with the user supplied arguments. And then depending on what this plain Haskell function here does, that could be all sorts of malicious stuff. For example, if this plain Haskell function is, uh, I don't know, uh, read file, then the user supplies uh, something like this, then that would bleed into the template. Right. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not not a 100% foolproof uh, thing, of course. So basically, the, the context you inject from outside, uh, if that is vulnerable, then there's nothing the template engine itself can do to prevent that. Um, the only alternative would be to use a template engine that doesn't allow this kind of injection in the first place. And that then limits the ability of uh, the flexibility of that language. So it's, it's, it's kind of a trade-off. Um, but yes, the remark from the chat, um, this largely applies to dynamic languages, um, is in principle correct. It's much easier to run into these things in a dynamic language. For example, the original Jinja implementation um, is much, much more flexible in these things, and it does allow dynamic imports at runtime. And that uh, basically uh, allows an attacker to inject whatever things they want. So if you dynamically include in, in Jinja too, then uh, it would actually load these templates at runtime as they are available. Um, okay, so this is this is basically the the, the basic structural solution um, to use a template engine that moves the burden of making sure we're uh, HTML encoding everything to the template engine. But that's just the first naive step. We can actually take it a step further. Um, we have been operating on the assumption that HTML is basically text, right? And so, uh, well, we need to HTML encode, but basically treating HTML as text and just concatenating text is, is fundamentally okay. But it's not, because HTML is not actually raw string data. It's, it's a different kind of beast, right? So we have raw strings and we have HTML. Uh, we can use types to make to, to tell the difference here. Right. So previously we had this function here. We had serve for HTML function that takes an HTML source, bit bit of HTML source as a text as a string, and runs in some kind of application specific monad to serve a response. And we have the HTML encode function that takes a string and outputs HTML as a string. And if we forget HTML encode or if we feed something improper to serve HTML, uh, it'll go unnoticed. It'll silently do the wrong thing. Um, and if we change that to use two different types, we introduce a new type HTML. It's basically just a new type wrapper on text, but it allows us to 
distinguish between text and HTML at the type level. Then we can write our serve HTML function with this type. It only accepts HTML. And we can make HTML encode to be explicit about the fact that its input is not HTML, but its output is. And now we still append strings essentially, but they're wrapped in a new type. So when we serve HTML, we can only serve something that has actually been wrapped in, in this HTML constructor here. And when we use HTML encode, we get a different type out than what goes in. Uh, so if we try to inject uh, HTML encoded things into text or text into HTML encoded things, then that will be a type error. Right? So we can no longer uh, end up with uh, forgetting to encode because if we forget to encode, we have a text and not an HTML and injecting text into HTML is now invalid. We need to inject HTML into HTML. And the only way to produce this HTML now is to go either through the new type constructor or to the HTML encode function. And of course, by not exposing the HTML constructor, we can even make it impossible for outside code to produce HTMLs other than going through HTML encode. Right. So that makes the difference between uh, silently doing the wrong thing and failing to compile, which is good. And of course, we can do both. We can use a structural solution for the injection right here, same expand HTML template function. But we also use types to make it clear that serve HTML expects, expects an HTML source and that expand HTML template takes HTML source, produces HTML source, but the parameters are not HTML. And of course, um, we're still left with the problem now that um, our HTML is um, guaranteed to be encoded, but not guaranteed to be well formed. Because our template engine here uh, basically still treats HTML as a special type of string. So a string is just guaranteed to be encoded, but it's not guaranteed to follow uh, a proper HTML document structure. Right, so this kind of thing is still valid as far as the template engine is concerned. It takes care of HTML encoding, but not about of uh, structural well formedness. So you can easily produce completely nonsensical HTML. And I think this answers the question from the chat that we can actually use uh, HTML DOM aware template engines like Blaze um, to generate our HTML. So this is what that looks like. Um, so we imported the, 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 the Blaze HTML module as H here. And now our template becomes a Haskell function, or a Haskell expression, actually. And not only are we making sure that we are properly HTML encoding everything, like here, the text function here takes a raw string as an input and outputs an HTML value. And this guarantees HTML encoding. So we're making sure that the HTML encoding happens. And we, we're not doing any sp anything special here, right? So it's, it's, it's just the default way of doing it. And if we forget this function and we pass in a text value, then that will be a compiler error. So the, 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 the default is to either do the right thing or to fail early. It never does silently does the wrong thing. But we also guarantee some structural things here. So for example, the only way to, to, to get HTML tags is through some one of these functions here that produce tags. And they all make sure that we're all we're pairing, opening and closing tags as required, and that um, we're not having extra greater than or less than or stuff like that. No, nothing, nothing, nothing weird. So all the HTML we produce with this is fundamentally well formed. We we always have proper opening and closing tags, and, and we don't have attributes outside of tags and stuff like that. Um, we can still violate some things. For example, we can use Blaze HTML um, 
to have, say, a div right underneath a table body without any table cells in between, or we can have form form elements out of, we can have um, form widgets outside of forms, like an input or, or, or a button, uh, all sorts of things that are technically invalid. Um, but we do still get a lot of useful guarantees that make it harder to escape the HTML structure. Okay. Um, so the next part um, is going to be um, more about more general security concepts. So maybe this is a good moment to answer uh, any questions about the concrete vulnerabilities discussed so far, and then maybe take a little break. Um, so so uh, there's a question about uh, yes. putting a script inside an h.txt. Yes, so what happens when you do that? So the question is basically, um, if you go in a template, and you do something like uh, so where foo equals script. Well, what happens there? Um, the text function will take this and it will HTML encode its value. So what you get here is essentially LT GT. And then, and then we, again the lt slash script. So this is what you get. So it's fine. It look weird, but it won't do anything unsafe. If you wanted to actually emit this exact string, you would have to use something else, some something other than text. Uh, so uh, I, I don't even remember because I never use it. But uh, basically, uh, I think you you would have to explicitly uh, use the HTML constructor or something. So basically, don't don't do that, and you're fine. Let me just look this up. Is the HTML type? Oh yeah, this one. So it has a conveniently awkward name, which is great because it makes it really awkward to do this. So this is this is basically an awkward name that says, "Yes, I know what I'm doing. Please just do it." And it's it's sufficiently awkward that you don't accidentally use it. You only uh, use this one when you really know what you're doing. And the, the, the pre-escaped part is a reminder that whatever you are converting to HTML is supposed to be pre-escaped. So uh, it's up to you to make sure that it's safe. OK. Um, any more questions? I don't think so. Right, so I suppose let's uh, let's take a quick break, and um, we'll be back in let's say uh, five minutes. Great opportunity for caffeination. Very good. I shall go and make myself a cup of tea. See you in five minutes. Five minutes it is.
So how's the caffeination going? Are we I back? My cup of tea. Yeah. All right, so let's move on to slightly bigger picture. Structural code weaknesses. So far we have been discussing very concrete vulnerabilities um, and concrete strategies for avoiding them. Um, but there is of course a bigger picture to it. When we write code, we usually have a process going on. We do things in a certain way. And security is part of that process, whether we want to or not. And um, a very common approach to security is the ad hoc one, which uh, basically works like this, that you write your code, you make it work, you check it for the happy path, and then at some point, you discover there is a vulnerability in there, either because you've been hacked or because somebody told you that it's vulnerable or because you're not passing an audit or whatever. So there's there's a vulnerability and you, uh, you do go through your usual process. You create an issue, you assign it to somebody, somebody fixes it, gets patched. And the concrete vulnerability that has been reported has been fixed. It's gone. Great. So now your code is secure again. So you repair what you know to be broken, basically. It's like when you drive a car, the check engine light comes on, drive to a garage, and you have to check the engine, basically. So something's broken and you have it repaired. But of course, that's problematic because it does fix the known vulnerabilities. So, for example, you know there is a crosshair scripting vulnerability some, in some page, and you fix that. But you don't fix all the other crosshair scripting vulnerabilities that you don't know about yet. And what's worse, when you fix that one, one vulnerability, you may be introducing others. Um, so, it's not that great, really. So. Um, because it's mainly because it's reactive. So um, you only react to known vulnerabilities. You, you, you're, you're not doing proactive, not taking proactive steps to, to prevent problems before they actually occur. And opposed to that, we have the structural security where you uh, approach things in a more structured way, where you include security in your design considerations right from the start. Um, so the approach here is um, that you start with something that doesn't do anything, where everything is disallowed, where nothing and nothing nothing works. And then for everything that you make work, you verify that it is benign, that it's okay, that it's secure. And you construct your code in such a way that uh, every step you take, every, every feature you add, uh, is secure in itself and built out of secure building blocks, so to speak. So the, the goal is to set yourself up for success. The goal is to um, make yourself, uh, make it easy for yourself to, to, to keep things secure, and to avoid vulnerabilities. But this approach would not just fix the known vulnerabilities, but also some unknown vulnerabilities. So, for example, in the cross-site scripting uh, example, um, you may be in a situation where you have written your code and uh, it's uh, there is a, a vulnerability in there. One page has an ex a cross-site scripting flaw. Um, but rather than just patch that one flaw, you go and take a step back and you ask yourself, okay, how did this happen? How is it possible that I made this mistake here? How did this bug come about? And then you notice that you don't have a structural solution to cross-site scripting in your code base because you're just injecting those uh, snippets everywhere. Uh, and you respond to this vulnerability, not just by adding HTML code to the offending injection, but you actually rewrite your code to use a proper template engine that prevents the mistake. So you adopt a structural uh, solution to the problem. And you can even take it a step further 
and ask yourself what in your workflow has caused you to ignore this this, this vulnerability. What how how could you how could you have structured your own work or your team's work differently to um, to avoid such flaws? So, for example, it could be that uh, there are people in your team who would have spotted this, but they never looked at the code. So why is that? Because you don't have a policy of having every commit audited by someone who knows their security stuff. And if you change then your workflow to to have these audits as an integral part of it, you will catch future problems more likely. Right. Right. So this is this is basically what we just talked about. We uh, want to HTML encode everything, and the naive approach. The ad hoc approach is to just wrap everything in HTML and code as, it, as, as, the, as the vulnerabilities arise, we patch them one by one. And the structural approach says, hey, but why is this even possible? Can we write our code such that it's not possible anymore or that we have secure defaults? And at this point, I think it's a good idea to talk about um, different defense models. Um, the, regardless of whether we apply ad hoc or structural defenses, um, we also can um, apply defenses at different levels in our stack and in, in, from uh, different angles of the, of the system. Um, so to illustrate that, let's look at the physical security counterpart. So physical security is uh, something that, uh, that, that um, plays a role in, uh, in, for example, when when some important politician visits a place, uh, the area has to, has to be secured, or um, basic, basically anything where you have uh, a lot of people who can potentially do harm, physical harm to some target. Um, and usually um, the uh, the danger is is, is, is is contained in this area here. So that we have an area, and within that area, we want to pretend, prevent certain things from happening. And to do that, we need, we have a bunch of guards that we can use, right? And this area here is, is, is like all this blue, this blue bit here. And we want to make sure that whoever moves around within the blue area uh, is physically safe by some definition or is as safe as we can make it and this area also has a bunch of entrances here that we can use to get into and out of the area now a typical approach to this is perimeter security right so we, we just put go uh, one, one guard at, at every entrance and in order to make it into the area you have to make it past the guard, and the guard will then, I don't know, frisk you, run you through a metal detector or whatever it takes to make sure you don't have anything on you that might um, allow you to do bad things. Or they might even check whether you have a specific access token that, that proves that you are who you say you are and that you are one of the people that are trusted to be in this area. Now, um, so as long as all these guards do their job and, and do the right thing and are actually effective at keeping bad guys out, and each of these guards is 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 uncompromised, it actually works, right? So anything that makes it past the guards will be trustworthy, and so only trustworthy people will be in, inside this perimeter, and it's great, it works. The other approach is we take a bunch of guards and just fill the entire area with them. So we have, I don't know, police officers or whatever patrolling the entire area so that everything that happens in there is seen by at least one of them. And whenever somebody tries something bad, they will have a bunch of guards on them within seconds. Um, and again, as long as all the guards are, um, are effective, the, the, the entire area is going to be secure. But we need a lot more guards. I did this example here, we had eight of them. And here, this is, I think, 16 or 20 or something like that. So it's a lot more. And the larger the area gets, and the more, uh, the fewer 
entries and exits the perimeters have has the, uh, the more of the scale tips. But the perimeter can be breached and it's enough for one single guard to be compromised, let a bad guy in and suddenly none of our security is worth anything anymore. One, one bad actor getting in past the guard, once they're past the guard, they can do anything they want because there is no additional checks inside the perimeter. Once we're in, we're in and we can do anything and the entire security of the whole area is compromised. Whereas if in an area model, one of the guards is compromised, well, we can still do bad stuff, but only within this very small area here. And the more guards we put in here, the more redundancy we get. So we have these overlaps here, where more than one guard sees the area, just like here. So actually the area where we can do bad things in this example is just this here. It's very small. So the area that is um, unsecured in this scenario is roughly proportional to the number of compromised guards. Whereas here, a single guard being compromised leads to full compromise. Right? But we need more guards for the area model. So if we only have eight guards to play with, then this is strictly worse than the perimeter. So we, we can't possibly achieve full coverage with only eight guards in this example. So in a nutshell, the perimeter security philosophy is that we maximally guard the border, the perimeter, and we trust everything that happens inside on the assumption that our um, perimeter is perfect. So as long as the perimeter is, 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 is working, everything on the inside can be trusted and we can move around freely on the inside. Right? And we can, of course, go and introduce some redundancy here, like having two or three guards at every entrance. So then we need to compromise all guards at this one entrance to get in. But the fundamental problem, of course, still remains. Mm. And by contrast, the area security philo philosophy is that we just guard the entire area and we only trust what happens within the coverage area of each guard. So uh, there's no... Uh, implied trust based on having made it past a guard. Perimeter security obviously needs fewer guards, um, but the big downside is that each guard becomes a single point of failure. So compromising one guard leads to total compromise of the entire area. Whereas area security requires a lot more guards for full coverage, but coverage is proportional to the guards, it's the number of guards per area and compromise is somewhat contained in a natural way. And because of these economics, um, physical security will often use perimeter security because guards are expensive and um, making it such that com compromise of a single guard becomes possible, uh, becomes difficult is, is, is relatively straightforward or re 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 relatively realistic. Um, approach. But when it comes to information security, we can also apply these two models, but things look slightly different then. So let's look at one example, um, a corporate network. Typical company, couple hundred machines on the inside, and um, of course they need to access the internet, but they also need to talk to each other. There's like, for example, a shared, uh, shared hard disk somewhere. So we set up a perimeter where we maximally guard the edge of the network, so the public facing router or firewall, um, and we trust everything that's on the inside. So basically we say that if you're on the inside, on the local area network, then you're a trustworthy machine. And we do no further uh, checks. We just assume that whatever you want to do is allowed. Right. Mm. So for example, um, on the chat, microservices have been uh, man uh, uh, mentioned. Uh, you could apply this thought to a microservice architecture where all the microservices talk to each other over, say, uh, HTTP um, without any further authorization, or no further authentication, uh, just because a microservice connects to you uh, is proof that they are allowed to connect. 
because the entire microservice system is behind a firewall, some 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 kind of uh, perimeter, if you will. Right. And in the corporate network, we can do the same thing. Um, but the problem is that once we have compromised a single machine on the inside, we can easily escalate from there because just being on the inside uh, is taken as proof that you are allowed to do things. And by contrast, the Avria model uh, would work such that you maximally guard each individual machine. So you put up a firewall on each and you put up uh, authentication borders between the machines. You use uh, transport level security, HTTPS, between any two machines on the network. And same for the microservice architecture. Whenever a microservice connects to another service, uh, you force them to authenticate and you do the communication even behind, even on, even if, if they are on the same in the same data center or even on the same uh, VM host, you still use HTTPS or, or TLS or whatever encryption you you, you need between them to um, basically achieve area security. And mm, the same attack scenario on our corporate network here means that once you have compromised one machine escalating that compromise to another machine is much harder because there are additional checks in place. So let's say um, there's one machine that has access to uh, the, the, the corporate shared hard disk, but you've only managed to compromise the machine to the point where you have an unprivileged account. So you can't actually access the, the credentials that you need to connect to that shared drive. And a shared drive would still won't let you in even though you're on the inside of the network. So your escalation becomes much harder because it, there's an additional check in, the, in there. Same for a web application. So suppose we have this simple web application like the, the two applications we looked at in the earlier parts of this lecture. We have an application and it takes an input from an HTTP request and perimeter security basically says, when you accept these rec this request, you validate it, you check every single bit of it, and once you pass that validation, you just assume that everything in the request is trustworthy, and everything you do from there on just goes through. Right? So you 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 only defend at 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 the at the HTTP boundary at the point where the request comes in, and once the request has been found good, you trust it. Whereas the area approach would be to validate everything at every boundary. So for example, at the HTTP boundary, obviously, but also then when you take some, one, one such value and you go to the database, or you, you, you feed it into your domain logic, before you do that, you validate the values and make sure it's it's only one of those values that makes sense and then when you go to the database you add another validation step making sure that only valid things that are supposed to be in the database go there and then when you pull data back out from the database you also mistrust the database you validate the outputs you get from there make sure those are okay and then you inject them into your html response and you validate them again to make sure that only valid things go into your html and then you send it right so at every at every transition layer and level, at every boundary, you um, put up extra guards. And when that happens, the attack scenario is, is quite different. Right? So in the, in the web application, um, for example, suppose you want to do an, uh, an SQL injection attack, then you would have to validate at the HTTP boundary for the, for the perimeter security and just filter out all inputs that could potentially be SQL injection attempts. Right? Um, and then once you have validated that there are no SQL injection attempts in your inputs, you just assume it's okay and you just let it go through and all sorts of uh, unsafe stuff happen in between and then you hit the database and you get your data back out and you assume that everything what comes out of there is okay and you just send it to the client. Whereas with area security, you would check at the HTTP boundary that uh, your inputs are uh, sensible. But then when you send them to the database, you make sure to still um, parameterize your queries, for example, 
uh, to make sure there's no injection going on, even though you have pre-vetted the inputs. So even though you have taken your input that is supposed to be an integer ID and made sure it's actually an integer, you still parameterize it to avoid any and all possibility of an SQL injection there. And then when you pull it back out, you still validate that what comes back matches your domain model. And when you render it into HTML, you still HTML encode it, even though you know it shouldn't should only be an integer, so there's no need to encode. But you still do it because you, you're applying this area security model here. And these two alternatives names are uh, what I use when I talk about these things usually. Uh, the coconut model, hard shell, soft fluid inside versus in-depth security where you go all the way through the stack and you apply your security guards at every level, at every transition. Okay. And I think um, it should be clear by now that perimeter security does not really work very well in information systems. Um, it usually does work okay in physical security, but the economics are just too different for it to apply in information systems. And the reason for that is, is manifold. Um, one important factor is that the guards themselves uh, must be very reliable in order for perimeter security to be uh, to be to be uh, useful. And with physical security, this is usually possible um, because those guards can be pre-vetted, and um, there's there's a lot of um, supervision. There's a lot of um, social control to them. Um, the, the, the 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 if one of those guards fails, is compromised, then that is very likely to be detected fast. And there's a lot they have a lot to lose uh, basically suppose you're one of these guards and you let someone in who then murders the president then that will be the end of your career and the, your life as you know it uh, so there's there's a very high incentive for those guards to to do their very best but in information security those guards are really just automated processes their code and they don't have ethics code just does what it's told to do mechanically. It, it just obeys whatever, whoever uh, manages to command it. Um, and so the reliability is, is very, very difficult to verify. It just takes one mistake and the code will happily do the wrong thing without you noticing. Um, so we can't really compare human guards with, with these uh, technical safeguards. Um, Another problem is that there are usually way too many unknowns to define a reasonable per perimeter. We we don't know where where the doors are. We don't know uh, the exact dimensions of our area that we need to to protect. Mm. It's much 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 less clear. It's 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 much less tangible. Um, and of course, digital information doesn't obey the same laws of physics that physical objects do. Um, information can be in many places at once, unlike physical objects. Um, information can be copied in almost no time and, and, and without any cost, without any, uh, without, without having to create physical objects for it. We can, we can send information across the world within milliseconds, basically. We can infinitely copy it we can almost, uh, it's, it's almost impossible to, to uh, do secure deletion of information. We cannot unshare information. So, for example, uh, if I borrow you my car and then you give it back to me, I can be sure that you no longer have my car. But if, you give, if I give you some information and then ask you to give it back, you can just give me back a copy and hold another copy yourself and there's no way for me to tell the difference. So all sorts of um, things that break the physical security intuition. And that's also a reason why perimeters don't work in information security. So that means um, that in order to um, to do uh, to, to to get a reasonable degree of information security, 
we actually have to apply in-depth security. So concretely, um, that means that um, we need to basically um, trust nobody, um, not even our own code. So in this, um, let's let, 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 let's let, let's go back to this um, this application here. Um, but no, no, not, not, not this one, the other, the pasta bin. So what we exploited there were actually several things. Um, the first thing we exploited was, of course, that there's this SQL injection vulnerability. Mm. But this here, there's another thing going on, namely that there's a lot of internal information being exposed here. So not only do we have this SQL injection vulnerability, but we're even telling the attacker how to how to get there, how, what exactly they need to do. Um, and I mean, it's it's, it's a useful, useful feature for development, but we're exposing this information here. So there's a second vulnerability in here. And the combination of these two made the attack a lot easier. Same with the messenger application. We had multiple vulnerabilities here. Right, so we have the reflected XSS vulnerability in here, but we could, only, we could exploit it not just because we can cross that script here, but also because our script can actually read the cookie. Right. So by reading the cookie, we could we could extract this information and send it elsewhere. And had we used the correct cookie flags, HTTP only and secure, this wouldn't have happened. Because HTTP only on the cookie says you can't access this from JavaScript. And that would have prevented the attack. Um, even though we still have the, the cross-site scripting vulnerability. And we could also have added some monitoring to our application um, that logs all uh, login attempts and all uh, session usages and stuff like that, and then run some analy analysis on it that raises a red flag when, when suspicious things are happening. That would, be, would have been another defense. Uh, we could have used all sorts of uh, additional in-depth defenses on the JavaScript front, on the, uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the on the on the HTTP front, and so on and so on. So there's a lot of things we could have done to stop this, and we did none of them. We failed on several fronts, several bugs, several failures in here that caused this vulnerability to be possible. Um, and it's, it's usually like that. Most compromises happen through a combination of, 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 of issues, or, or by exploiting a combination of, of bugs. Uh, so a single bug uh, is, is often something you, can, you, you can't exploit. Um, it's, it's when several of them play together that, that compromises usually happen. Can you clarify some of your <clears throat> earlier advice about um you know where where to validate. Uh, I mean, there's the, the, when you're saying you know, defense in depth and components right. and each other, right. etc. Um, what where yes. would you what would you give us sort of general advice on you know how to because obviously you can you know go overboard or you can do too much or you know you you've got a limited amount of development time. You've got to decide yes, sure. so where the most effective places to put these kinds of you know, enforcement boundaries or even if you're yes. So, so so I think I think the key. The key insight here is to identify your um, your trans transition boundaries. So, in a typical web application, you have an HTTP request, and that becomes uh, input data, and that goes through the domain logic, and uh, then we go to a database. So, we go to SQL, and we get a result set out, and then we go back to the domain types go through some more domain logic and we get output 
data and we get that back to the HTTP response. And the key here is to, to look at each of these domains here and make sure that whatever you have is is the, is, is, is is within that domain. So there's this, this idea of correct by construction. Um, for example, um, um, let's say, um, let me just think for a second for a good example. Um, right, so correct by construction. Um, let's say we have, um, let's say we have an order. So we could just say uh, we re represent this order as um, as a list of SQL values. This is what we get from the database, right? So we get SQL values. And um, so this is our order entry, and then our order is basically, uh, is basically a list of, of order entries. So if you have, say, a query like this, a star from order entries where or order ID is our uh, order. And this is what we get out. And of course, there could be anything. Um, could be all sorts of nonsensical stuff coming out of our database. But of course, what we want is more some, something more like uh, like this. Um, And so on, right? And if we pin these, these types down enough, then our order entry cannot possibly re represent anything that isn't valid in, in, in our domain, right? So we then need some sort of function that takes a list of SQL values and either gives us uh, an error or an order entry. And then we use that to, to make sure that whatever we have after this point is either that we're erroring out hard or that we have a valid order entry. And that valid order entry can only um, represent things within a certain within a certain domain, within a certain set of uh, that's what the types do. So um, for example, our order ID type makes sure that the order ID uh, doesn't contain anything that could lead to, to cross-site scripting. Right? It, it could be pinned down to an integer. Um, and we, we, we make this transition as early as we can. So we, we try to push out these transitions as far as, as, as we reasonably can. So for example, uh, here when we process the result set, right? so this transition here is what we're talking about. We try to do that as early as possible, immediately after we get the data out of the database, because we want to fail as, as soon as we can. As soon as we can make this transition, we try to make it. And if it fails here with an error, then we error out right away, instead of propagating the, the, in the potentially malicious data further down through the domain logic. And so this, this means that we, we put up our guard here in the form of this transition, this function here. This, this is what Puts up our guard. And then we come out of the domain logic, we may still have an order entry. But now we want to output HTML. So at this transition here, we need another transition, another function. One that says, okay, uh, suppose we have an order entry, and we want to turn that into HTML. Right. And we want to make that transition at exactly the right point, namely when it's time to construct HTML, not earlier. We don't want at some place here in the domain logic, we don't want to make 
this conversion already uh, because then we're dealing with these raw HTML values that no longer tells us what valid operations on this domain data are. Uh, so we push that out towards the HTML side of things. Uh, so um, the goal basically is to, to be as descriptive and as narrow as possible at each point in, the, in, this, in this whole pipeline. Right? And it's not, not, not even necessarily a matter of time because uh, this, this data structure here, it, 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 it almost pays for itself see because doing the, all this order logic with raw sql values is actually quite cumbersome quite awkward so, so making making the transition early is actually going to help us with a lot of other things too not just security it's much easier to reason about orders when when this is your type than when, when it's this when your order is just a list of lists of sql values you can't really do any meaningful operations on it without going crazy, whereas this is, this is perfectly reasonable, right? So I um, hope that answers the question. Um, right, yes, so indeed it is um, about correct by construction uh, rather than a fight to look for bad things. I think that that is that is the um, that's the main takeaway from this ad hoc versus uh, structural part to uh, this year. Right. So rather than uh, rather than keep uh, searching for uh, for broken stuff and then fixing it one by one, uh, you take a step back and you set yourself up for success. You use uh, the, the correct by construction principle, you use the um, uh, secure default principle to, to, to basically make sure that if you do something, it's going to either break hard and, and fast or it go, it's going to do the right thing. Um, right, remark here. Uh, checking that order ID isn't something that could trigger CSP sounds like a really weird thing to check for in the domain of orders. Well, you see, that's that's kind of the point that um, that's not not that's that's not exactly what I'm talking about. Um, let's go back to this one here. Um, the point is that you you're not checking that you don't that you no longer need to check as, it as as long as you're in the domain logic domain domain of values, right? So uh, the idea is that when you go from a result set to domain types through this here, um, you are forced to make sure that order ID can only be something that is valid as an order ID. So for example, you can have a new type order ID is order ID that wraps So you're basically um, making the fact explicit that order IDs are always integers. And you could take it a step further and hide this, hide this, hide this constructor here from the module exports. And then you export only this. Um, because order IDs can't be negative, for example. And order IDs can't be zero. Order IDs can't be infinitely large. All sorts of additional constraints that you might want on your orders. And um, order description. Now, order description is an interesting one. Um, just mentioned in the chat. Order description. Um, so you could you could have something like this here. That what you mean? Uh, hope it is. Um, so there's there's not a lot of validation that you can add here, uh, but when you then go from these orders to HTML, this last bit, then of course um, you would you would have to do the HTML encoding as part of this transition here. But still, you can uh, you can you could potentially benefit from this. 
and perform additional validation at the first step. So this this won't hold back. Um, this won't hold back cross-site scripting when you go from uh, SQL value to order description uh, through some smart constructor like this. Um, so you would still allow something like like this to be an order description. You don't want to to rule that out. I'm going to tell you a story in a second about why you don't want that. Um, but you 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 would of course uh, do this in this step here. Right. So in the, in the transition from um, order description to HTML. Right. So something like this. You could, for example, do um, something like this. So this would make sure that whatever order description you have is going to be HTML encoded. So this is your, your transition that you guard here. Uh, and of course, if that transition goes through a template engine, then it's, it's, it's even better because you can, you can basically get a free ride on whatever encoding mechanism is already there. Um, right, so I promised a story. Um, the first ever job that involved any programming at all had a system that would um, allow customers to um, give us their the address, name and address and uh, tell us that they wanted to become a customer and then we would send them um, subscription form on paper because that was still required at the time and so they would sign up for a service by signing a paper and sending it to us but before they did that they would self um, they would they would themselves give us their data so that we sent them the form and of course that form needed to be protected against SQL injection and stuff like that um, and the way that was done was basically um, a function that it wasn't Haskell, but uh, in um, something like this. Um, and it would um, basically um, do something like this. So, um, if you did, uh, for example, um, if you send a string like this, then it would, would cut it off after the after this, and you you'd just be left with this, and no injection could happen. Um, <laughs> a stored cross-site scripting attack through the input provided on the paper form. Yeah, that would be awesome. But it was it was it was equally equally bad. Uh, so so this is basically how the SQL injection protection worked. And after this, perimeter security, remember, coconut. After this, the input was considered safe. I would just inject that into the SQL query, and everything was great. And it it was actually somewhat successful at preventing SQL injection. But um, I thought it wasn't really a very good idea to do it like this. Um, so uh, I went and removed that and instead um, use uh, parameterized queries throughout and uh, removed this function and actually allowed a string like this to go through, but made sure using uh, a, a bunch of uh, other means that it would never make it into the query uh, by injection. And um, once I did that, um, we discovered that uh, a poor soul named uh, named O'Brien had tried 57 times to become a customer. 57 times, and each time he did that, he would he would fill in this form and 
say, yeah, I want to become a customer, please. And then nothing would happen. And uh, he would call and the customer support person would go and, and, and look him up in the database and they would enter O'Brien, right? Uh, and then the injection sanitizing, sanitizing function would cut it off here and would be left with O. But of course, a single letter would have uh, would have popped up uh, at one twenty sixth of our customer database, approximately on average, uh, and that would have just uh, been prohibitively too much and not meaningful at all. So we had additional logic in there that said uh, any search query that any search term with less than three characters uh, will be ignored. And as a result, the system just said no, we don't have any customers by that name. So they didn't find him, and I said, okay, yeah, well, something must have gone wrong. Uh, I'll add it for you and uh, add a note to that, and uh, everything will be fine. And they added the customer, and it, the record ended up in the same black hole and never popped up again until I fixed this. And then it turned out that, well, there were 57 of them, and he finally got to be a customer. So, yeah, that's, um, that's that story, basically. And the null journalist uh, is, is another example. Yes, or I think I think it was a, a, a vanity license plate, or somebody that had null as their license plate and ended up being assigned all the license, all, all the traffic violations that couldn't be linked to any existing uh, license plate. Right. Um, and this also highlights uh, another side of the story, namely that um, when you put up these. Uh, safeguards in the wrong place, you often end up uh, hurting legit uses, usages a lot. Um, there was another safeguard in the system that we also removed eventually that said um, your username or your, your name can't contain the words select, delete, update or insert. It's equally, uh, equally bad, really. Uh, it, it kind of um, prevents some attacks, but not all. It's easy to bypass, and it hurts legitimate usage quite a bit. It seems, it seems like this, these are the sort of cases where thinking about your, you know, customer data in terms of the actual types they are is, is a real benefit. That you don't yes. take these shortcuts yes, of using you know, special values nine 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 to mean something mm. particular, and then oh, yes, absolutely, you know, yeah, this clashes uh, now with something else. Yeah, that's 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 one of the nice things about Haskell, really, that we can trivially do something like. Uh, um, um, either error or result, uh, whatever error and result are, but we can we can basically use the type to to make a very clear distinction between uh, this is the actual value that we're interested in versus this this is uh, a magic value that indicates uh, failure. So. It's it's not not magic anymore, as compared to, uh, for example, uh, there's there's this famous thing um, where where a pop up says uh, error uh, the um, this one here, right? So it 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 it, it, uh, it throws an error, and then says that the error was that it's finished successfully, and how that happens is of course that sometimes. Uh, the magical value is zero, and sometimes the magical value is non-zero. And if you do the check the other way around, you say, okay, I'm going to check if there's an error, and zero means error, and then the operation finished successfully and returns zero to indicate that everything went fine. And then you go like, oh, there's a zero here. That must be an error. Let me check what the text is that I should display for this error and the text is the process finished successfully because that's what zero means. And then you say, hey, there was an error, the process finished successfully. Um, and that's all because our return type is basically int. And there's a magical value of zero that says it's, it's, it's okay or it's not okay. And I guess even when you do have to deal with you know less typed external systems like you know the database null or something, mm -hmm. it's still far better to make use of that database null and not end up with these confusions about like the string null versus you know, yes. the database value null. So yes. you can't get, yeah. you, don't want to, you don't want to allow any input from outside to end up being a null. It can only be one of the you know, string cases or whatever. Yes. And that's also an argument for pushing out the, 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 the conversions as far as you can. 
so for example, when you're talking to some service that just returns strings and some of those strings mean special things, then it's a good idea to introduce a domain specific type where these things are, are distinguished in the type and make the conversion as soon as you get the result back out of the external service. Right. So like, like the service might, might return uh, a string and if that string is uh, literally error, then that means something went wrong. And then you say, uh, okay, case um, output from service. And you say if that's literally error, then you, you do uh, a left uh, or even and otherwise you say it's a right. Or well, that is it begs the question of uh, how how do you get you know uh, the gen the genuine string error out of that service? How do you make oh, that yes, distinction? Of that, that, that is a problem with magic values. That is a protocol problem right here. Right. It's just that the protocol can't represent the legit error string here as a legit result. But that there's no way around that in, in, in such a badly designed interface. It's just it's just an example. Right. Um, what was the store selling? Um, I'm not going to tell you because that would uh, kind of uh, expose what uh, what the what the st which which store it might have been. So. Name suppressed to, to <laughs> protect, protect the innocent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, in this case, guilty is relative, of course, because um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's 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 a complex thing when you have. Uh, consultants building a system based on previous version built by the boss's nephew, um, metaphorically speaking. So it's, uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to assign blame here. It's just things that happen. All right, so where were we? Uh, and what's the time? Ah, 10 minutes left, right. So that uh, brings me to uh, principles, which I think is, is one something I, I really want to go into. So let's summarize. We have the in-depth security principle, which basically means that rather than just having one safeguard against every possible attack at one level of your stack and trusting it completely, um, you put up defenses at all levels redundantly, right? the more the merrier, uh, so that you can minimize uh, who and what you need to trust even within your own system. Then we have the secure defaults principle, which basically says that the user of your code or of your system or, or whatever subsystem you have, um, the user uh, must be in a situation where whatever they do, the default or the obvious usage must lead to either allowed failure or to faultless secure operation but never to silent failure or to inse silently insecure behavior. So if I do something, I want the compiler or the information system or whatever it is I'm talking to, I want it to either do the right thing or tell me immediately that whatever I'm doing is the wrong thing. Uh, I don't want it to accept my input, my malicious input and do the wrong thing, do something insecure. And there's all sorts of uh, examples uh, for this. Uh, it applies to a lot of things, not not, not just uh, cross-site scripting or SQL injection. Um, for example, when it comes to authorization systems, where uh, you take a user ID and then you want to check whether that user can do a, th a certain thing. Uh, it's a good idea to build these systems such that uh, if you start with a default situation and you don't configure anything, then it will always default to rejecting your request, right? Um, so um, I try to do something. I say, hi, I'm this person. I want to access this document. And without any further configuration, the authorization system should say, no, you can't do that. I don't even care what it is you're doing. I don't have any rules saying you can't, you can do it. So you're not allowed deny by default. This principle can can be applied across the stack, really, to to all sorts of things. Same for uh, SQL parameters. Um, instead of saying uh, I accept everything, 
unless it contains a single quote, like in the O'Brien example, you go, um, I accept nothing except things that I know have been uh, treated properly, have been secured. So if, if I can prove that, that a certain thing is, thing is secured, then I accept it, otherwise I deny. Um, whitelist over blacklist principle, closely related to secure defaults. Um, a whitelist means that uh, you start with nothing is allowed, and then you punch holes into that to allow specific things that you know are uh, desirable and valid. Whereas the blacklist goes and says everything goes, and then I put up extra guards to prevent the things that I don't want to happen. Right? So an example of a blacklist is uh, when you have a server and uh, somebody um, tries to hack you and you detect it, and you add their IP address to your blacklist and to, to prevent future attempts. And that's, that's kind of... Um, a necessary evil in this case because you can't start with nobody can connect usually especially not if it's a public facing internet server uh, so in this case we're forced to use a blacklist but in other cases we we want to prefer the whitelist if, if if at all possible so for example when we build a firewall for our system we say the default is that that you can't listen on any ports but i know that you're a web server so you probably need port 443 for https so i'll open that one specific specific port for you and allow you to listen on that one on the public internet but no other ports so port 22 port 80 they're all closed because you don't need them all right so any port is closed except 443 and that means that whoever tries to connect to you whatever services are run on this server they won't be allowed to connect to the outside world on that point. And that's a huge advantage because it's much easier to, to uh, reason about whether a certain port is open, right? Rather than say, oh, it's, it's not on the blacklist, so it must be open. You say, ah, it's not on the whitelist, so it's not open. And any port that we don't know whether we need it or not will be closed. Whereas the, the blacklist approach would have those ports open because we're only blocking those ports that we know we won't need. And also connected to that is the correct by construction principle, where we build our types and our data structures such that they can only represent states that we know to be valid at that stage of processing. Right? So uh, rather than starting with a type that can represent anything like a hash map or, or, uh, or some, some, some kind of uh, variant type or unit type or whatever, and then um, actively um, erroring when we see something that we know is bad, we start with a type that can only re represent the states uh, that we know are good, or we start with a, with a type that can not represent anything, and then we add constructors or whatever to give us just the things that we do want. Okay. Then, the very well-known KISS principle, keep it simple. It's completely orthogonal, but it's equally important. Um, the simpler your code, the easier it is to verify that it is correct. So um, it's this uh, obviously no flaws versus no obvious flaws thing. Um, something that is simple, like if you have a piece of five lines of code, I can probably tell you whether it's secure or not. I can be fairly sure about it. If you give me 50 lines, it starts to get tricky. If you give me 500 lines, I'm just going to give up unless I have additional uh, tools to help me reduce the scope somehow. So keep it simple. A anything, anything you add to your code that isn't strictly necessary uh, increases your attack surface, increases your audit surface, increases your reasoning requirements, and all that comes at a cost. And finally, remember the human. Best technical countermeasures are useless when there's a human trying to bypass them, trying to compromise them. Great example is these uh, password strength checkers. When you have a password uh, password prote protected system and you make people pick a password, and then you run a checker on it that makes sure that your password contains uh, uppercase and lowercase and numbers and, and non-alphanumeric characters, and then people come up with very very 
with passwords that are very hard to remember and they write them down in a text file on their desktop and that basically um, destroys the use usefulness of that password or they might they might reuse those passwords across all sorts of systems because remembering uh, 100 very secure very complex passwords is just not something you can ask people to do so you need to keep that in mind um, or there's this this thing where uh, at a hospital they have this system where they um, put in all the um, all the patient data and um, doctors and nurses would use that system to update the patient status through the computer system, which is great. But of course, you can't just leave those terminals open all the time. Um, you need to protect them, because otherwise anyone could just walk up to any terminal and, 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 and look at patient data. So what did they do? They gave everyone an account with a name and a password, and they made everybody log in whenever they wanted to update the patient status. But of course, when you're a nurse doing uh, doing, doing rounds and, and, and I don't know, uh, you have like five minutes per patient and you need those five minutes to do your thing. And then you need to, you need to log into the computer system and with, with this very complex password. Well, that, that just doesn't happen. So what happened was that um, entire nursing departments, entire teams would share the same account with a password like AAA and because that was simply faster because you, you just needed to, to type the password instead of the username and the password uh, because everybody had the same username and, and could just log in and the password was very short so you could type it fast but of course that reduces security a lot and in the end they uh, switched to a system where instead of logging in with a password uh, you people people had this, this 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 physical dongle that would give them access to the system and they were just instructed to guard that like their eyeballs. And everybody had their personal dongle, so uh, logging in with your dongle would actually give you the right account. And if one of them was compromised, you could just block that that one dongle and, and issue a new one. Uh, and that ended up being much more secure. And then finally, let's look at guidelines for programming securely in Haskell. So there's a few special things there compared to uh, Few other languages. Um, use the types. We've talked about this quite a bit. Uh, you can use types to enforce guarantees at compile time. And of course, security relevant guarantees are no exceptions there. Correct by construction applies, and the types type system is a great way of um, lifting this to the to the to compile time. Use abstractions. Uh, this is a two-sided thing. Uh, bad abstractions probably hurt more than they they help, uh, but good abstractions, as Dijkstra put it, uh, allow you to be precise on a higher level. So a good abstraction won't uh, lose precision. It won't uh, introduce um, inconsistencies, but it allows you to control a, a, a large large amount of complexity with relatively simple code, and by uh, by making everything correct by construction at every uh, abstraction layer boundary, you come to a point where you can control all this complexity in a reliably safe way from, from a, at, a, at a very high level. And that helps keep things sim simple and spot uh, unsafe behavior. Right, yes, the purpose of abstraction is not to be vague, but to create a new semantic level in which one can be absolutely precise. Yes, that's the exact quote. Um, right, uh, but do remember that types are on a system. Um, they help keep uh, honest programmers honest, but they are not a guarantee. There's always going to be backdoors. There's always going to be ways of bypassing the type system. We need them, they are useful like unsafe perform IO or the uh, uh, pre-escaped HTML, these things, uh, we do sometimes need them and sometimes they are useful, sometimes they are necessary. So um, there's always going to be a way to, to bypass the rules, but that's not the point. The point is to make, to create a situation where you have to opt out of security, not to opt into it. And to keep the, the naive code, the, the, the part where you don't think about security secure. 
um, use modules for encapsulation. It's a great way of, of, of limiting the scope that you have to reason about. It's the uh, crusted base idea. Um, so, for example, a, a module boundary is a great way of enf enforcing the fact that all your database connectivity goes through uh, a small limited uh, set of functions and then you just verify these few functions and because you're not expo exporting anything else you can force every uh, any other code to go through this interface um, and that means that uh, you can be sloppier about ver uh, about verifying all the outside code as long as you have this trusted base going on um, use the testing infrastructure types get you a long way but you always always want to add tests to 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 verify your code because uh, proof is one thing testing is another and together you get more uh, more certainty and the caveats um, performance I just uh, saw somebody ask about the denial of service in Haskell yes that is, is a big problem um, performance is hard to reason about so you need to be extra careful there um, non-strict evaluation is a common pitfall um, managed memory is a potential pitfall because you no longer control when memory gets allocated uh, where your data goes in RAM when it gets cleans up, cleaned up when it gets deleted um, another caveat is the ecosystem uh, Hackage for example has made large leaps on the security front in, in recent years um, but it's still such that Basically, anyone can upload anything under any package name uh, that isn't yet uh, claimed. So uh, that means that just because it's on Hackage doesn't mean it's secure. You're you're basically on your own there. Uh, so uh, you can't just trust a package to be secure uh, just because it's on Hackage. All right, so um, I think, yeah, so uh, performance, the denial of service thing, that is a very, very real concern in Haskell, especially because reasoning about performance is so hard. And fortunately, I don't have a good solution to that uh, other than uh, manual diligence. So that's, that's, that's um, in, this, in this context, that's, that's a big problem we have in Haskell because unlike other side effects or other effects, we can't really capture performance in the types. So we have to resort to the usual techniques, but because Haskell is so high level, it's easy to produce code that has uh, performance edge cases that can be exploited. Right, and that basically concludes it. Um, some basic entry points for further reading for those interested. Uh, these are good starting points. There's a lot of information out there. Most of it is not Haskell specific, unfortunately, which is part of why we developed this uh, material and the longer course, which is available from well-typed. Uh, let's see. Uh, so any other questions on the chat? I suppose we can, uh, can stay on the video for another five minutes or so. Uh, so let's see if there are any questions left that I haven't answered yet. Um, I don't think there were any that I were. I was tracking. No, I don't think so. Just just going through it, but I think I think we we're mostly uh, uh, done. Right. So yeah, the okay, performance so, one is a is a whole other interest, very yes, interesting it's, topic. It's a, it's a huge it's a huge kind of worms, uh, and uh, well, as I said, there is no uh, truly uh, there, there is no silver bullet there. Um, I believe Duncan. But it's, we, but we it's have, not. Uh, it's not a council despair. There's actually a number of you know. But it, it's yeah. It's a lot of effort and. Yes. Well, you, you, can, you, can, you can you can you can kind of put. There. You, you you can put up uh, the usual defenses, and um, an advantage we have in Haskell is that we can kind of um, limit uh, various system resources at the runtime system level, with RTS options, for example. Um, so it's 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 an, it's not a lost cause, and, and Haskell is not fundamentally worse than most other languages in this regard. Reason about reasoning about performance is 
part a general. Yeah. But uh, well, there are a few special things about Haskell, particularly in non-strict evaluation semantics, uh, the high degree of, uh, of abstraction we we use, and the fact that the compiler does a few very wild uh, optimization optimizations that make Haskell possible in the first place. Um, but For the yeah, most part, though, uh, the, the kind of things you're worried about are are these kinds of asymptotic complexity things, where yes. you know yes. data that's provided by you know the possible adversary, possible opponent, whatever, yes. where they Indeed. can cause you to do. And Excellent. so you don't need to worry too much about the you know the low level, you know, is this compiler optimization happening most of the time? Mm -hmm. It's it's mostly about no, fortunately not. You know, analyzing your code for how much work are you really doing? What is the asymptotic complexity yeah. of your algorithm? Yes. Yes, and, and, and the non-strict evaluation, of course, means that sometimes um, things happen at uh, surprising moments. Like reasoning Which about whether they do the or do not between, happen. Yeah, worst case, yeah. worst case, asymptotic complexity yeah. versus like yeah. amortized uh, complexity. Yes, but there's also the, the 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 thing where you can accidentally create uh, unbounded recursion, and depending how it happens. Uh, you just end up with a process that uh, keeps running forever in constant memory, or one that keeps allocating forever until it runs out of memory, and that can happen really fast. So it's uh, it's interesting, interesting topic in its own right. And I believe we do have a, a course from WellType that covers uh, performance, don't we? One of the things I've been dealing with. Uh a lot over the last couple of years with the uh, yeah. the Irish K blockchain project. Mm. In, obviously, in a, in a blockchain node, you know, it's a network service. It's, it's dealing with adversarial network input uh, yes. from other nodes all the time. And yeah, absolutely, you have to think about the CPU, you know, resource use, the network resource use, the memory use, because all of those are things where you know, if you get that wrong, the adversary can cause you to consume all of your resources and yeah. then stop being useful. And that's uh, an effective denial of service attack. Um, but I think I think you're right. I think there's there's, you know, there's a few Haskell specific things that I think we've done. But I think a lot of it is just you know your bread and butter computer science, looking yeah. at asymptotic complexity. Yeah. Well, one 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 interesting what, what thing is my my, my favorite uh, denial of service attack uh, hash does, which exploits the fact that a hash map, uh, which is right. usually constant Absolutely. constant time, um, becomes linear uh, linear access uh, when all the keys in it hash to the same value and so you that's, can and, and if, the, and if, the if you know that the exact hashing you can you can you can trigger yeah. that with uh, with uh, with with the right inputs right and this the, the the thing about haskell here is that the canonical response the canonical defense which is to generate a, a new salt for each hash map uh, is a bit uncomfortable yeah because generating a new salt doesn't, uh, doesn't fit nicely with is, purity. Is, involves effects. It needs it needs to run in I/O or something. Uh, so your pure data structure that you had is no longer a pure data structure. You know, now you need impure. Uh, you, you need stateful computations to generate uh, your your pure data structure, or your conceptually pure data structure. So if you don't way. if you don't need the little bit of performance gain that the hash map gives you, I mean the best solution there is just don't use hash based data structures. Use yes. ordered based data structures, and yep. then you get guaranteed. And this, yep. this is this is one of those asymptotic complexity things again. You mm -hmm. just go yeah, to asymptotic complexity and you say, okay, order based data structures are guaranteed, you know, n log n, and the hash ones right. are yeah. usually this, but with special cases where it becomes linear. Yeah. Like, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, the, the 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 worst case is is what, what what ruins it for us there. Yeah. And the attacker is the worst case. Yes. And you say you can't you can't benchmark that. That's one of the kings where. Looking at the asymptotic complexity. Yeah, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't catch that with with tests normally, yeah, because it's very specific. So there's a uh, question on the channel. I have a Haskell specific security question. Um, some package infrastructure services include security warnings and updates natively, like GitHub has some about um, you know, mm. JSON, uh, um, JavaScript uh, packages. What is best best practice here for the Haskell ecosystem? Yeah. Oh gosh. Huh. Uh, that is a good basically, question. <laughs> yeah, the, the sad answer is we don't really have anything here, unfortunately. Yeah. Maybe you should go and help so, us make one. So yeah, that, 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 that means that hand. means you're you're on your own. Um, it it helps a lot to pin down your dependencies and then uh, uh, somehow uh, gain trust in those specific versions. So that's one thing you can do. 
and fortunately the infrastructure we have is fairly good at pinning pinning these uh, these versions so you have uh, stackage which uh, prints down everything per release and uh, if you don't use stack but but uh, build directly from hackage e.g. using kubel you can still pin down version numbers with the uh, freeze files and such so this is something I would highly recommend if, if, you, if you think this is... It is possible in principle on Hackage to, to deprecate a, a particular version, but it's not a very strong yes. you know, notification yes. measure. True. Um, I, I think that is um, a, a case where... And it's absolutely it's worth really looking into how it, what, what, what security guarantees uh, Hackage gives you exactly and what it doesn't. Uh, so for example, packages on Hackage are not audited by any third party by default. So uh, if you want audits, you have to uh, do them yourself or, or uh, pay someone to do them. There is no community effort for, for, for some sort of centralized uh, auditing to happen. Um, but Hackage does give you a few guarantees, such as that uh, when a package gets uploaded, uh, it is actually uploaded by one of the official maintainers of that package as far according to Hackage. So each, each Hackage package each name on Hackage uh, has a maintainer assigned to it. And when you first upload a new package, you become the maintainer. And after that, it has to be uh, uh, transferred uh, from you to that other person uh, according to uh, publicly visible rules. So when you download a package, uh, you can be reasonably sure that it was uploaded by, or you can be sure that it was uploaded by who, whoever uh, Hackage says it was uploaded by, and yeah, at uh, least at least then, part of the download system is secured by. The, yes, the and uh, Hackage uh, Hackage system. does hash packages to make sure that what was uploaded is what arrives on on your uh, on your machine when you download it, so that that path is uh, secured. But um, there there are no structural solutions to tracking what has been audited, what has been vetted, and uh, uh, the fact that there are usually very large and deep dependency graphs to most projects uh, means that you have to uh, go quite far if you want everything audited. So it's not, but... Uh, Another thing that's been discussed on the channel is this thing about, um, there's, this, there's this feature in GOC uh, that was added a few years ago by, I think, Simon Marlowe based on um, uh, some requirements they had at, uh, at Facebook for one of their applications about limiting the amount of memory that can be allocated yes. by a single thread, which is yep. interesting. That's an yeah. interesting. Yeah. So you, you 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 can already limit memory usage, for example, for the for the for the heap, uh, with the RTS options. That's the overall is, heap size. Yes, yes, yeah. and it's absolutely something I would recommend. Yeah, because it means that rather than uh, eat up all your memory and all your swap and then bring the system to a grinding halt, uh, a misbehaving Haskell program will just exhaust its heap and then fail, and the rest of the machine still keeps churning along happily. Yeah, so relying on OS level protections is, is very often a good solution. Yes, that too, yeah. But again, in depth, so why not do the RTS thing and set OS limit quota? And possibly also monitoring on top to raise a flag when, when a process suddenly starts allocating a lot of memory or stuff like that. So the, the set allocation counter uh, feature that was being mentioned on the channel, that, that one limits the amount of, not the total allocation, um, like the total amount of memory in use by a thread at any one time. It limits the yep. amount that is linearly allocated. And yep. that, that, that was used in, very good originally idea. used in a, in a system where it wasn't dealing with untrusted input as such. It wasn't like running, you know, random scripts, but it was, it was running, you know, um, sort of plugins that were written by, you know, other people than the kind of mm -hmm. core system was written by. Yep. And yep. they wanted to defend against things that were accidentally like you know the wrong asymptotic complexity mm -hmm. so they wanted to be able to just kill these things off after they would run for yeah not not too long yeah. in time but too long in in allocations yes that's um but that's a fairly niche uh yeah it is case okay. a nice example is actually this this thing I, I've, I've used here it's an application i wrote to manage all these vulnerable targets mm -hmm. and um, it basically runs each of these in a separate process Right. Um, level protections. Yeah. Yes, but it uses uh, it uses um, it, it relies among other things on a runtime system limits to make sure none of them none of those can run out of memory or can can eat up all their system RAM. Use more memory than yeah. So, for example, we have this brainfuck interpreter here, 
which is quite fun. So you can write a, a brain fog program here, like, uh, like this, print something. Got another question on the channel about um, noting that monitoring and raising war warnings is very helpful. Uh, do you have any recommendation for tools on monitoring and logging warnings? Um, not Haskell specific. There's all sorts of uh, solutions for that uh, at the OS level, which is where I would do it. But it depends a lot on which exact uh, provisioning uh, approach you take, uh, whether you run in Docker containers or on metal or in virtual machines. Or, uh, so, uh, if, if you're trying to monitor like, application level metrics um, rather than OS level metrics, obviously OS level, as Mr. Bear says, there's lots of, lots of solutions. Um, but a Haskell specific, you know, in use with other generic tools uh, solution when you've got application level metrics that you want to monitor. Uh, a, a really good simple one is just EKG. And then there's, mm -hmm. a, there's an yeah. EKG to Prometheus adapter. Um, and then if you, then you can use yeah, standard standard tools like Prometheus and Grafana and whatnot to set up uh, yeah. metrics and warnings and alerts and whatever for operations people. Right. Logging, so that's, that's logging is is, is is kind of there's this kind of this whole rabbit hole of logging systems that you can dive into. Um, can can go uh, very far with that too. Then uh, there's all sorts of considerations there too. All right, should we uh, should we wrap up? I uh, you, you mentioned you would post um, your slides uh, afterwards. So people can go. And... Uh, yes, uh, Andres said he would um, he would put them on uh, Google Drive, I think. Okay. So uh, I expect All there right, to so be. We'll, we'll post, the, post the link soon. afterwards. Yes. Great. Right. So I'll uh, look out of the video now. Thanks for listening, and uh, enjoy the rest of the react. Okay. Great. Thanks everybody. Thanks for listening. <laughs>